Hi everybody, Jeremy from the Snowboard Asylum here and welcome to the first part of a four part video series that we've put together on snowboard design and construction. Now I've wanted to do this video for a fair few years now and to be honest I've never really found time to do it. So while we're in lockdown and we've got no shops open I thought I'd take the opportunity to lock myself away and finally get it done. Now the reason that I've wanted to do this is that over the past few years, snowboard design and technology has progressed at such a speed that it's been almost impossible to keep abreast of some of the innovations that manufacturers have come up with when it comes to designing boards. Plus, it doesn't really help that a lot of that tech has been masked by fancy marketing names. Now hopefully what I want to do in these videos is just to break through that marketing jargon and show you what this tech actually does and how it works to make you ride better. Now in the first part, we're going to take a look at board basics, concentrating on shapes, camber profiles and side cuts. In part two, we'll then shift to how boards are made, concentrating on the core. For episode three, we're going to go through how manufacturers use different materials to form the board structural layers and how they then integrate advanced composites into those to enhance the performance. Finally, in episode four, we'll take a look at different base materials and how they affect how the board rides. We'll then finish off the season by taking a quick look at metal edges and sidewalls. Now, I hope you find this useful and it gives you some insight into what goes into your snowboard. If you do like it, please don't forget to give us a like. And if you're interested in seeing more snowboarding content on our channel, please subscribe. So the first board that we're going to look at is the twin tip. Now the twin is one of the best selling categories of the boards and it's one of the best sellers because it's generally so much fun to ride. Uh, it's the shape of choice for freestyle riders but it's also really great for anybody that just wants a board that's really playful. Uh, now what makes this board a twin is that it's identical at both the nose and the tail. So if we were to fold this board in half, you would get a complete exact match and overlap of either end of the board. So it really is uh, a fully symmetrical shape. Now what's also symmetrical about this board is the flex. So running from the centre of the board out to the tip and tail, uh, the flex is identical. Also, the stance on a twin is centered into the side cut as well. So if I were to take a tape measure and measure it from the reference point of the back foot to the tail, and then the reference point for the front foot to the nose, this measurement would be exactly the same. So everything is central and everything is well balanced. And what that's gonna give you is a really controllable feel underneath your feet. You're gonna know totally what's happening with the board and it's gonna give you confidence to push on. Now what it's also gonna do is just allow you to ride forwards and switch exactly the same. The board will feel identical riding in both directions. And that's one of the reasons that it's so popular for freestyle riders because you can do switch runnings or forward runnings, switch landings, uh, or regular landings and the board is going to perform exactly the same. There's not going to be any surprises and it's not going to catch you out. Now what you also have with pretty much all twins on the market now is this kind of more blunt tip and tail profile. Now this blunt tip and tail works in harmony with this slightly shorter upturn and a smaller direct contact patch here to reduce what we call swing weight. Now what swing weight is, it's just how much weight is focused at the extremities of the board. And the reason that's important on a twin is because you wanna use this for freestyle. If you've got a lot of weight at either end of the board, you're gonna have a lot of inertia when the board is spinning. So this excess weight is just gonna mean the board is gonna spin on its own accord. So what manufacturers are always trying to do is kind of cut away any excess weight at those tips. And they generally do that by kind of thinning out the profile using lighter materials in the tips and also just kind of cutting off any excess weight there. Now by reducing that swing weight, you're then just going to give the rider more control. Uh, less weight at the tips means that you can control the spins a lot easier because that inertia isn't going to carry it on on its own. So that's fundamentally a twin tip board. Twins generally come in in different kind of levels of twin. So you kind of have like a pure out and out jib board, which will have very little upturn, really kind of cut off ends just to get rid of any excess weight, but won't particularly work in 
in anything other than perfect park conditions. We're going to the other end of the spectrum. You can have a twin that's a little bit all terrain focused, which is still going to give you that balanced ride, but it's still going to work great over the rest of the mountain. So uh, a twin tip. So the next board we're going to look at is an evolution of that original twin tip design, and that is the directional twin. Now, the directional twin is probably the most popular category of board, and the reason it's popular is because it's just a lot more versatile. If you're looking for one board to ride absolutely everything on the mountain, the directional twin really is the perfect choice for that. So, what is the directional twin? Well, basically, the overall shape-wise is identical to a twin tip. So, again, if we fold this board in half, uh, you're going to get a perfect overlap between the tip and tail. But the big difference between this and the true twin is where the stance sits on this board. So if you can remember on the um, original twin, we basically took a measurement from the reference point to the nose at the front binding and the reference point to the tail at the back binding. And on that board, it's equidistant. Now on the directional twin, if you did exactly the same thing, that measurement from the reference point on the front foot to the nose would be longer than the reference point to the tail. And the reason you do that is just really to give the board a little bit more versatility. Having a slightly longer nose profile is just going to improve performance in the powder. It's also going to improve the, board, the way the board rides through chop. That nose is just going to blast over things and cut through things a lot easier than the twin would, which kind of has the potential to hook up. That shorter tail is going to drop the back end of the board in powder, just make it a little bit less effort to ride in deep snow. But what it's also going to do as well is just let you power up the tail of the board when you're carving on piste. So really what you've got on the directional twin is a, is a pretty balanced overall shape, but a shape that's a bit more functional when you want to get out of the park and play around on the mountain. So the next shape that we're going to look at is the directional shape. Now directional boards are generally aimed at people who are looking for a bit more performance riding in one direction or riding in powder. So if you're one of those riders that just loves to ride around on piste, loves to hit backcountry powder or side hits but never goes near the park, then a directional board is probably the direction that you should be looking at. Now, it's called a directional board because everything's set back on the board. So you've got a longer nose profile than tail, you've got a setback stance, you've also got a setback flex and side cut and camber as well. So just running through a little bit more detail on this. So nose profile, if we were to measure from the reference point on the front foot to the tip of the nose, and then the reference point on the back foot to the tail, this measurement would be a lot longer than this measurement. Now what that's gonna allow you to do is gonna let the board chop through uh, crud and chop a lot easier. It's just gonna cut underneath the, underneath the board. Uh, it's also gonna give you a lot more floating powder because the snow is just gonna channel underneath and give lift at the front end. At the back end of the board, this shorter tail is going to sink in powder snow, again making it really easy to ride. But what it's also going to do as well is concentrate power towards the tail end of the board. So when you're carving on piste and riding hard, this is just going to let you really drive through the back end of the turn and really give you a dynamic feel when the board is on its edge. As I said, with a directional board, the camber is also set back as well. Again, just giving you more rise in that nose for powder and focusing that carving performance to the tail where the flex of the board is also stiffer. Now, what you're also seeing on more, or more directional boards as well is this reduction of material at the tip and tail as you had with the twin tip. And again, that's really there to cut swing weight for the board. Now... The reason you want to cut swing weight on this kind of board is slightly different to the reason you're cutting swing weight on a freestyle board. On a freestyle board, you're cutting swing weight to assist with the way the board spins. On a free ride board, you're cutting swing weight to give the board a more positive and natural turning performance. Now, I mentioned this in one of our product videos and got one of those kind of slightly passive aggressive 
uh, responses back in the YouTube comments as to why that would make a difference. Well, basically it makes a difference because if you've got weight at the tip and tail of the board or too much weight at the tip and the tail of the board, when you're carving, <clears throat> this excess weight is always trying to push out. So it's trying to push out at the nose and it's also trying to push out at the tail. So you've got to work a lot harder to keep the board naturally engaged. What it's also gonna do as well is it's gonna make the board tram. So when you're kind of on the carve, if you've got loads of weight at the extremities of the board, you've got to work harder to release the board out of the turn and then get it into the next turn. By cutting those swing weights, it makes the board way more controllable when it's on its edge. So it's gonna ride a lot more neutral through the carve. It's also gonna be a lot easier to come out of a carve as well. If you look at those old snowboard videos from years ago where snowboards had big long noses, just watch the amount of effort that riders have to put in to get the board out of the turn. There's arms swinging everywhere. But by reducing the weight at the tips, you don't need to do that. So a directional shape, Perfect for anybody that wants to ride peace, perfect for anybody who wants to ride powder. So just really kind of value what kind of riding you do. If you don't ever go near the park, there really is no point in buying a twin tip or a directional twin because you're really going to miss out on some great performance that you're only going to get from a riding a directional board. So um, that's it, directional shapes. So this next shape of board is really just a follow on from that directional board we've just looked at. And that's really just to show you the difference with a more powder focused directional board. So as you can see from this, um, you've got a far longer nose at the front than you have tail at the back. So if we were to kind of run off that reference point for the bindings on the front foot and measure the distance between there and the tip and do the same uh, between the reference point on the back foot and the tail, this is a lot longer. So it's generally just a few centimeters on most directional boards, but when you get to powder boards, this becomes a lot bigger. And the reason it's there is just to give you loads of volume in the front end of the board. So you've got that extra length, and generally on a powder board, you've got extra width as well. So when you hit snow, it's just gonna channel under that front end of the board and give you loads of lift. And it's gonna be effortless lift as well. That narrower tail is then just gonna sink into the snow and just maintain the float without you having to lean back on the back foot all the time. Uh, generally with a powder focus directional shape, you're gonna have less effective edge. And the reason being is because when you're riding powder, you don't massively need a long effective edge. It's just all about getting float. So that's really the powder directional board, just designed to give you loads of volume at the front end, sink that back end in the snow, and just give you an effortless, amazing riding pow. So the next category of board I want to show you is a relative newcomer to snowboard shapes. And this, this board shape can be used as either a twin, a directional shape, or a directional twin. And that is what we call the volume shifted board. Now, original thinking in snowboards was if you wanted a board that was going to work great in the powder and give you a really solid stable ride, you needed to go longer. Um, and that's why we've always seen such a big variation in length of boards because generally the heavier you are, the longer the board you need to ride. But over the last few years, we've just seen this technology shift that's really come from surfing and that's working on overall volume of the board. And basically what a volume shift is gonna allow you to do is ride a shorter but wider board. So you're gonna retain the same surface area as riding a longer board, but you're just gonna have a shorter and more maneuverable ride. Now, we're really kind of seeing that come to the fore for, for riders that just really like that kind of surfier, more laid back ride, because, because you've got extra width on them, they're not as dynamic and fast reacting as you would get with a traditional board. But that lazy, surfy ride is really quite intoxicating. Um, I personally now generally ride a lot of these volume shifted boards most of the time, just because I'm getting on a bit and I really like that relaxed, lazy style. 
So basically what you're doing on the volume shift, uh, and I say this is kind of uh, going to be a pretty quick intro, is you're just adding more width down the whole length of the board. And what that's going to do is just increase this whole overall surface base uh, area of the board. So you're going to get lift from volume rather than lift from length. Um, that generally gets lets you ride a shorter overall board, so you've got that little bit more manoeuvrability with it, and that kind of general laid back style. Um, so that's really kind of the volume shift, and that, as I said, you can just add on to a twin, a directional twin, or, or a directional board. It works through all the different categories. In this section, we're going to be taking a look at board profiles. Now, what we mean when we talk about profiles is the shape of the board when you look at it sideways on. So, basically, the side profile. Now, of all the technologies used in snowboard, this is the one that has undergone the most change over the past 10 to 15 years. Now, the reason that we've seen so much progress in profile shapes is because it's one of the key elements in defining the performance of the board. Now, the profile really does determine so much of how the snowboard rides, from how it floats in the pow, through to how it carves on piste, even down to how much pop it gets off kickers. Now, we're going to run through the most common and most popular board profiles, look at how each one delivers different levels of performance, and hopefully show you which one will work best for you. So, let's get started. So, if I was making this video 15 years ago, uh, we'd probably be running into the shortest section of the video now because uh, there was only one profile available then and that was Camber. So um, for me, Camber is probably the logical place to start this section. Now, as I said, 15 years ago, everybody, every, well, pretty, every board was a Camber. And then it went slightly out of fashion and we kind of shifted towards rocker profiles. Now, the rocker trend didn't really last very long because... Um, a lot of people very quickly found out the flaws of Rocker and then you start to see this shift going back towards Camber. Um, and a lot of brands kind of experimented with profiles back then, just kind of bringing into Camber into kind of more Rocker orientated profiles. So kind of creating more a hybrid of Rocker and Camber. But still to this day, if you're after a really performance ride, Camber is still definitely the way to go. Uh, for me personally, I still prefer riding the Camber board to any other type of board. So uh, what is Camber and what does it do? Well, basically Camber is this arc of the board here. As you can see, if I put my finger in the middle of here and push it down, the board will go down. So what happens, you've got the contact points of the board. So the contact points are the part of the board that are engagement with the snow. And then the camber runs from contact point to contact point. Now what that does is it works in conjunction with the board side cut. So this is the side cut of the board here, this wasting through the middle here. And what that does is it's a radius of a circle. So uh, the longer the radius, the longer the turn, the shorter the radius, the shorter the turn. And how that works with the camber is that when you've got the board on its edge, you're basically compressing that camber down. And what compressing that camber down is doing is powering up this whole side cut. So it's energizing the full length of the side cut. It's also powering up these contact points here. So when you initiate the turn, these contact points are under load, so they're gonna bite and really engage. That power through the turn is then gonna hold the edge all the way through the turn as well and shift power to the back end of the board. Now, if you don't have a, a camber there, what's gonna happen, there's no energy in there. So the faster you go and load this up, it's not gonna hold that energy. It's just gonna blow out the turn. By having a camber, you're gonna put loads of energy into this already, and it's gonna be really dynamic and hold its edge. So the more camber you have in the board, the more aggressive and the more powerful the board is. But remember, that's not necessarily a great thing if you're not an aggressive or powerful rider. If you're not an aggressive or powerful rider, you'll only be compressing that camber a little bit and you won't be engaging the side cut for its whole length. So it's just gonna be really skiddy and just ride like a ride terrible, to be totally honest with you. So when you're looking at buying a board, 
be realistic on how you ride. If you're an aggressive rider, you want stiff, aggressive camber. If you're not an aggressive rider, buying a stiff, aggressive camber board is just going to be throwing money in the bin because it's going to ride terrible. So um, that's camber. If you're looking for a more performance ride, great performance on piste and more of a charging feel, camber is definitely the way to go. So the next profile that we're going to take a look at is an amalgamation of both camber and rocker. Uh, I'm going to call it cam rock for the purpose of this video because it, like I said, it's an amalgamation of camber and rocker. But lots of different brands have the different names for it, but it's pretty much the same thing. Now cam rock is pretty much the best selling of all the camber profiles and the reason it's so popular is because it creates a board that does everything really well and it really doesn't have that many downsides um so what is cam rock well probably the best place to start is comparing it with what a traditional camber board would look like so if you think back to the traditional cambered board uh, the camber ran from contact point to contact point, so it went the full length of the board. Now, what they do with a cam rock board is that they pull the camber in a little bit um, in from the contact points. So the camber will run from this point to this point. So when the board is on its edge, you've still got that compression, so you're powering up that full length of the side cut, which is going to give you a really positive edge hold and a stable ride on the edge. But what they do from beyond those contact points is the board then turns into a rocker. And what that's going to give you is when you're compressing the board down, those contact points are going to lift up from the snow. So you're going to have a far less hook free ride. The board is going to become more playful. And it's also going to give you better performance in powder because you've got more nose. So the snow is going to channel under there and give you lift and float at the front end. So this really is a profile that does everything really well. And as I said, because you're still powering up that side cut, you're still going to get a really dynamic and responsive feel on the piece. But when you want to play around, when you want to hit powder, this profile is going to do it all really, really well. So this next camber profile is again a combination of both rocker and camber. But unlike the cam rock profile, which is predominantly camber, this profile is predominantly rocker. So for the purpose of this, I'm going to call it hybrid camber. But again, it does come under lots of different names depending on what brand you look at. So Burton call it the Flying V, Never Summer call it the Ripsaw. But in terms of concept and function, um, they're pretty much the same. So, um, as I said with the cam rock, the predominant uh, profile on that is camber. Whereas on hybrid, the predominant profile is rocker. So, as you can see here, the board touches in the middle and then operates out like a traditional rocker to the contact points. So, what that's going to do is give you that more playful, hook-free ride at the tip and tail. Um, and just give you really great floating power. However, the difference between the hybrid camber and a traditional uh, rockered board is that instead of just being rockered all the way through the length of the board, they actually add camber zones underneath the feet, as you can see here. Now, what those camber zones do is when the board is on its edge, it's going to power up underneath the feet and give you really good grip underneath the feet direct to the edge. So... Whereas that original rocker shape is very hard to drive power into, those rocker zones are going to let you drive power into the rocker. So you're still going to get great performance when the board is on its edge. It's not going to wash out at higher speeds like a standard rocker board does. So if you're after that kind of more versatile, floaty, um, almost kind of freestyle feel but still have really good edge hold really good grip through the turn then a hybrid camber really does work really well um, it doesn't give you the same uh, stability and edge, edge hold as a full length camber but if you want a setup that's going to be really playful and really versatile and a setup that's going to give you confidence to try and push quite hard and not have to worry about kind of catching an edge or the board digging in when you go in powder um, 
a hybrid camber is a really good solution to that. Now the next profile that we're going to look at again is an amalgamation of both camber and rocker, but this time it's just a little bit more specialist in its uh, in its performance. So this is what we call directional rocker. Um, Directional rocker is probably not the best description of it because really it is directional rocker and directional camber combined. So this is really now becoming the norm on free ride boards. So boards that are designed for riding on piste and riding in powder. And basically what it is, is it's just adding extra rocker at the front end of the board. So if I compress the camber back down, you'll see how the rocker now runs right down this full length of the board. And what they've done is then shifted the camber back towards the back end of the board a little bit. What that's going to do is just, you're still going to have all that power through the side cut, but that power is now moved back towards the back end of the board a little bit. Now, if you can remember back to when we were looking at directional shapes, a directional shape is really powerful out the back end because it's just designed to blast you through the turn and drive you out into the next turn. And by moving that camber back to where the performance is, it's just giving you a more direct and a more dynamic overall feel. But then also having that longer rocker zone at the front end of the board is just going to allow this nose to cut through crud and also give you way more lift in powder. So what you've got with a directional rocker is a shape that works great off piste. It works great in bad conditions, but it also works really good when you're charging hard on the piece because you're centering all that power and performance directly under your feet and towards the back end of the board. Now we can't talk about profiles without talking about Battalion's Triple Base or 3BT as it's better known as. Now Triple Base or 3BT is an exclusive to Battalion and Lobster Snowboards. It was invented by a Norwegian inventor called Jürgen Carlsen and it really has transformed the way people think about how snowboards work. So what is Triple Base? Well, uh, it's better to just give you a little explanation and a little view to start with. So generally, with a traditional snowboard design, the base is flat all the way from nose to tail. Now what Battalion do, which hopefully you can see it here, is if you look down the board here, you have a flat section in the middle, and then the side base here is angled down. So the base is now uh, separated into three separate sections center flat base and two side base uplifts. Now that side base uplift runs down to the center of the board where it then becomes flat like a traditional base and then repeats again at the tail of the board. Now, when you listen to a lot of reviews about what triple base does, um, there's a lot of people who don't actually get what it does and what it was originally designed for. So, what I thought I'd do on this section of the video is just run through what Battalion's Triple Base actually does and then some of the other side benefits that it does. So really, when you're riding a snowboard, what happens, you're basically compressing the camber and the side cut down and you're powering up this whole length of the side cut. And it's this powered up side cut that really assists the board to run through the turn. Now, because of the way flex works, the optimum angle through the turn is underneath your foot, and this is what you're driving the board through. But with torsional flex, what's trying to happen is from this point here, the board all the way out to the tail and nose is wanting to release back to flat. So if you think about it, when you're initiating a turn, what you do is just move your weight over the front foot to power up this contact point and to keep it driving through the turn. You want to come out of a turn, you shift your weight to the back end of the board and you power up this contact point at the tail. Now the reason you're doing that is because this is wanting to release. So you're kind of naturally engaging this to stop it releasing. Now. The reason it wants to release is because this base is flat. So the base always wants to return back to its normal position of being flat. Now, with triple base, by pre-angling this section of the board at the contact points, when the board is on its edge, 
this section of the board now no longer wants to return back to flat. It's now in its natural position and that is engaged. So what you don't need to do on a triple baseboard is when you're initiating the turn, you don't need to drive power into this contact point at the nose and you don't need to drive power into that contact point at the tail coming out of the turn. This board is now energized all the way down its side cup. So you can generally ride this board a lot more relaxed and a lot easier. You don't need to worry about moving your weight around. Now what that also does as well, and one of the big advantages that people talk about rather than the actual uh, way it assists through the turn, is the triple base also lifts these contact points. So when you're compressing that camber out, these contact points are lifting from the snow giving you a lot more playful and hook free ride so that's one of the reasons why a lot of freestyle riders really like triple bass because it does release these contact points and giving you a more of a skate like feel now historically one of the big disadvantages of triple bass is because you've got this little uplift here it always felt a little bit sluggish trying to engage the turn but over the last few seasons what they've done is added this sidekicks technology at the contact points and basically what that does as you initiate the turn it hooks up straight away so a triple bass now turn initiation and turn exit is exactly the same as with a traditional board but you've still got that advantage of the side cut operating and never wanting to release now within triple base as well you've also got different flavors depending on what type of board it is um, and the reason you've got different flavors is because of the way triple base works if you want a board that's really turny you want more side base upturn you want a board that's stable uh, for riding jibbing and park you want less side base upturn so what you find within the range all the boards that are uh, very park orientated have wider flatter sections through the middle and narrower up base side turns where the boards that are designed for turning have narrower flat sections and wider side base upturns so really what you get with triple base is a design that that really kind of does everything for everybody. It's really great for turning, it works really good in powder snow, but it also gives you a hook-free ride without losing performance from having a full rocker. In this next section, we're gonna take a look at side cuts. Now, to be honest with you, side cuts are something that most people seem to ignore, but alongside camber profiles, they're one of the most important aspects of a board's performance. Now, I'm gonna keep this intro pretty brief as we go into a lot more detail during the main section, uh, but it's worth just going over how and what the side cut does. So, basically, the side cut is the waist shape of the board looked at from above. Now, if you flip the board over, you'll see that the waist shape on the base is trapped with a metal edge that runs between the base and the side wall of the board. Now it's this metal edge that engages with the snow and allows the board to follow the arc of the waist shape. And it's this interaction of the edge and the arc of that waist shape that lets the board carve a turn. Now the reason I followed the profile section with side cuts is because that interaction is also affected by the shape of the board's profile. The more aggressive the profile of the board, the more energy that you're gonna drive into that edge. The lower the profile, the less energy. So it's a great way to determine the overall riding characteristics of the board. Now, to be honest with you, side cut technology can get really technical. So in this section, we're just going to look at the most commonly used side cut shapes, as these are going to cover about 95% of the boards out there. You can start to look at clothoid shapes and parabolic side cuts, but to be honest with you, there's really no point. Plus, I once looked at the equation that they used to work out a clothoid side cut, and it was about 15 pages long. So let's get started. So the first side cut shape that we're going to talk about is the radial side cut. Now the radial side cut is the most popular by an absolute country mile and it's probably going to account for 90 odd percent of the snowboards out there. Now the radial side cut is really just kind of what it says it is. It's taken from the section of a circle. So if I kind of run this up here, this section here is basically part of a circle. 
and what the designers will do if they want the board to run uh, turn tightly and quickly they'll take a section from a smaller circle as you can see on the image if they want it to turn long and fast they'll take a section from a larger circle again as you can see on the image and then it basically runs from small to large depending exactly on how you want the board to perform so any side cut radius that says between five and seven meters is going to create a board that turns relatively quickly any side cut profile between seven and eight meters is going to give you a really kind of stable turn anything over 9 10 11 meters is going to give you a really long laid out turn um, it really is that simple the beauty of a radial side cut cut is it's very easy to understand what's happening under your feet so it's predictable um, it's easy to develop as well so that's one of the reasons why so many boards use the standard radial side cut Now the next side cut profile that we're going to take a look at is an evolution of the radial side cut and that is the multi-radial side cut. This, as the name implies, is formed from blending multiple radiuses to form a single side cut. Now the big advantage of multi-radius side cut is that it allows the designers to create a board that has precise performance through the turn. Instead of following a regular arc through the carve, the multi-radius delivers different performance in different areas of the turn. So, for example, if you want a more progressive arc, you'll blend a larger circle at the front and back of the board with a smaller circle in the middle, as per the image. This combination creates a side cut that has a more relaxed and predictable turn entry and exit, but still gives a really dynamic response through the middle of the turn. Alternatively, if you blend two smaller circles at the tip and tail with a larger circle through the middle, this is going to give you a board that has quick turn initiation, an exit, but a more predictable feel through the middle of the turn. By combining these side cut profiles with the machine flex profiles of the core, it allows the designers to create very specific riding characteristics in different areas of the turn. Right, so the next side cut profile I'm gonna look at is a little bit difficult to explain without kind of sounding like you're waffling and talking rubbish, but I'm gonna try my hardest. So, we're talking about the asymmetric heel side edge. Um, now, the best starting point when it comes to this side cut profile is just to quickly talk about how, uh, how you drive power into the turn and to make the edge work. So when you're on a toe side turn, you bend your knees into the turn. And basically by bending your knees into the turn, you're then shifting your weight over the edge, which is really gonna engage this side cut and really drive the ball through the turn. Now, on the heel side edge, because your knees only bend in one direction, it's more difficult to get the same amount of weight and drive onto the heel side edge. So a heel side turn is always biomechanically more inefficient than a toe side turn, purely and simply because you can't get your weight over that edge. So you're never gonna be able to drive that side cut as hard as you would on a toe side turn. So the concept with the asymmetric heel side edge is to put a deeper side cut on that heel side turn. And because you can't drive it as hard as you would a toe side turn, by having a deeper side cut that's working less well than a shallower side cut, the performance becomes closer. So if you have identical side cuts on either side of the board and you're driving one harder, it's going to be more efficient than the one that's not being driven as hard. So by putting it slightly deeper, you can put less effort into it to get the same amount of performance. I hope that makes sense. Um, it, it's quite difficult to explain it without, like I said, sounding too waffling about it. Um, now with an asymmetric heel side edge, you're generally seeing that on twin tip boards and, and that's because the heel side edge always stays the same. So on this Yes Greats, this side is always the heel side. So if you ride um, Goofy, you ride it that way. If you ride it regular, you ride it that way. This heel side edge is always the same. Um, 
it does work and it does give you a more balanced overall ride. Um, it's not masses, but it's but you can notice it. Okay, so now we know how the side cut functions on the board and how it allows the edge to track an arc through the turn. Let's now take a quick look at how manufacturers use different technology to enhance the performance of that side cut. So, the majority of side cut profiles basically follow the arc of either the standard radius profile or the multi radius profile. However, some brands modify the profile of that radius to increase performance. Now, the brands that use this tech generally give it a fancy marketing term, but it usually falls into one of three categories. For the sake of convenience, we're going to call these categories traction enhancement, pressure manipulation, and asymmetric. So the first thing we're going to look at is traction enhancement. Now this is a technology that really came to the fore with Mervyn's Magma Traction. The simplest way to describe this tech is that it follows the same principles of a bread knife. So basically that means it adds disruptions along the edges which create additional traction or bite points along the length of the carve. These allow the edges to really bite into snow a lot harder in pretty much the same way as the serrations on a bread knife cut through the crust. Now, traction enhancement comes in many different forms, but all of them pretty much work on the same principle. Now, if we take a look at Limtex Magna Traction, which is the best known of all the traction enhanced side cut, you can see the serrations running the full length of the side cut. These create traction points along the full length of the edge, allowing the side cut to really bite into even the hardest of snow. Now, if we then look at the Jones interpretation, you'll notice that their bumps are far less defined compared with the Magna Traction, and that they only place them at three different points along the side cut. Now, Burton used similar tech with their frostbite edges, adding additional bite points under the toes and the heels. In fact, most brands that have traction enhancement in their range generally add it into two or three zones along the edge of the side cut, as opposed to the full length as per the Magna Traction. So, what's the difference? Well, to put it simply, and notwithstanding patents, etc., the full length Magna Traction delivers an amazing performance at high speed and when cruising on the piece. However, at slower speeds, it's less predictable and can sometimes catch you out being a little easier to hook up. By reducing the severity and the quantity of the serrations, the board becomes more predictable, reducing that chance of hooking up, while still enhancing performance on the edge in harder conditions, albeit by not as much as with the full length serrations. So, which is best? To be honest with you, it's horses for courses. Now next up, we're going to take a look at what we're going to call pressure manipulation. Now this is easy to explain what it does, but it's a lot more difficult to explain how it does it. So basically the concept of pressure manipulation edges is that by manipulating the profile of the side cut radius, you can control how and where the energy flows along its length, directing power to either specific areas of the side cut or moving power more efficiently along the full length of the side cut, therefore improving the performance of the edges. Now, we'll start this section by taking a look at Salomon's equaliser, as this is the, probably the most complex of the pressure manipulation side cuts. Now, I'm going to try my best to explain this, as the mathematics behind it are quite technical. And to be honest with you, maths was really my forte at school, grade four in old money. Now, as per the traditional side cut, you start with a regular radius. The smaller the radius, the tighter the turn. The longer the radius, the longer the turn. Then, by a series of mathematical equations, this arc is then converted into a series of straight lines, as you can see on the very basic image that I've put together. Now, as these straight lines are compressed into the turn by the camber, they still form an engaged arc. But because the energy is running straight rather than through a curve, it runs more efficiently along the length, enhancing pressure along the full length of the side curve. Now, that's a, a really basic description of equaliser. It's obviously a lot more complex than that. Again, as a technology, equaliser has been refined over the years and now comes in multiple variations. These are tuned to the riding characteristics of the type of board that it's used on, ensuring that it delivers the optimum riding performance for each style of board. 
Now the next technology that we're going to take a look at is Yes's underbuy. Now this technology works in a completely different way to Equalizer as its main function is to control energy flow to specific areas of the side cut rather than give a more efficient energy flow along the full length of the side cut. By channeling energy to certain parts of the side cut, the designers managed to enhance the turning performance of the board without having to stiffen up the overall flex. Now as you can see from the image, Yes placed dents in the side cut under both the toe and the heel at both the front and back of the board. These dents disrupt the arc of the side cut, taking energy flow away from under the toes and heels and redirecting it out to both the contact points and the center of the side cut. By powering up the contact points, the board's gonna engage and finish the turn a lot more dynamically, whilst the center of the side cut will feel more energized, giving a more stable feel through the turn. Now in terms of side cut disruption, Underbite is just one of a series of side cut disrupted boards from Yes. It's really worth taking a look at the Yes website to check some of these out as they've got some ingenious solutions to enhancing the performance of the board. So that's video one complete. I hope you found it useful and managed to cope with my dull nasally monotone presenting. Now in the next video we're going to take a look at what's inside your snowboard and why manufacturers use certain materials in the design and construction of the board. So thanks for watching and hopefully we'll see you on the next video.